Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hi, can you hear us? Hello. Can you hear us? They're on mute, so they can't answer us. Well, they have unmuted just now. And they've promoted them. Well, I can you hear me? Okay. No, this is left. Hi, can you uh, can you can hear you me? Unmute, please? Hundred percent. No, can you hear us? We can hear you. Hello. It says that I can't start my video because you because the host has stopped it. Can you hear me? Hey, one second, please. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear us? I can hear you, yeah, but I can't see anybody. Mm -hmm. And can you see me? Hello? Hello. This is Noel yeah, Cameron. It's Noel Cameron. Can you see me? Oh, thank you everyone for, for coming. We really appreciate you being here with us today. And also thank you everybody who's joining us on the virtual platform. So today we are celebrating the Bird 230 book launch. But really, as, as people have been part of the COE for some time, we know what an important milestone this actually is, not just for the Bird 230 study, but for the participants that have been involved in the study, for the various people that have seen the study through all these years, for the friends of the Birth 30 cohort, the supporters, the funders. Um, and in particular, it's a celebration of a great milestone for our very own Professor Linda Richter, who has been for some time putting pen to paper and a lot of thoughts in getting this project done and dusted. And in the project, I mean the book itself, but in the process being assisted by many, many others. And you'll hear more about that in a bit. We are celebrating a launch of a book that really talks a lot around the importance of such studies in the African context, but more importantly, to the people that it has touched in so many ways. I'm saying this because I really want to get you to read this book, because that's really what the story is. My name is Leitu Kapoya. I'm a friend of the COE. I'm that friend who shows up when there's nice things that are being done. It's good food. So, but in a capacity uh, as somebody who's just assisting in this event, I'm going to now hand over, just after I do that little bit of housekeeping, to our Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation who will do the official welcome. But before we go there, just a bit of housekeeping. The loos are right outside the door. As, we, as you exit, you see them right in front of you. If you could please put your phones on silent mode. There's apparently no water in all of Bramfontein today, so no running water, but we do have bottled water for you. We, do, we did come prepared. And with that said, let me now hand over to somebody who needs no introduction to the COE human. She's known as the bigger big boss, but in the university, she is our very own DVC for research and innovation, Professor Lynn Morris, over to you.
Thank you very much. And really, this is uh, such a delightful occasion um, to be here in this wonderful room and to all be together and to celebrate what's really a remarkable um, achievement. And, you know, when things are, uh, go this long, you know, it's, it's, it's just wonderful to also look back and reflect. And I think, as you all know, this is um, turning 100 this year. And so there's lots of, you know, time to reflect and think about how far we've come and what we've achieved. So uh, so we certainly see this as part of the, the celebration. So I want to welcome you all to the, to the launch of this fabulous book. And we've got in our room all of the researchers. Uh, we have the donors, so very important, DST, NRF, who helped fund the COE who, that gave rise to this, uh, this research project. So thank you all for coming. And of course, the other uh, supporters of this book, um, and uh, those of you have played a part in making it success. So this launch represents over 30 years of the seminal birth to 30 cohort, uh, still considered the largest and longest running birth cohort covering child health and development in Africa. And yeah, just to keep something going that long is, uh, is very impressive, especially when it's on grant funding. I know how hard that is. Um, this momentous milestone also coincides with the author, Professor Linda Richter's NRF Lifetime Achievement Award that uh, in 2021, and I was actually at the uh, at the event, uh, and she gave a wonderful account of all the students she had trained and all the wonderful achievements that her team had has has made. So this book is called Birth to Thirty, a study as ambitious as the country we wanted to create. Uh, Linda weaves together the stories. Uh, the people and the science that makes up uh, this 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 book, and you know I must say I um I don't know if those of you know that the Seven Up series it was so <laughs> I was fascinated by that, and I guess we all have this fascination with watching people almost vicariously and watching how how things unfold. Um, but in this book, which is obviously a scientific book, uh, Linda expertly positions the personal contributions from participants and staff together with the key scientific findings and trends from the data within their historical and contemporary context. It's a very rich source of scientific data. It's the only large longitudinal study in a low or middle income country with a number of closely spaced measures of cognition, growth and personality across time from early childhood to adulthood within the context of family and broader socioeconomic factors. The study's major contribution is showing the ways in which experiences and exposures in early childhood create avenues to adult health and human capital. But it also shows that these effects are not fixed. There's a substantial room for individual trajectories to be changed and that we should do everything we can for children and adolescents to thrive. And that's really what's so empowering about this. That interventions actually make a difference. The participants to whom are dedicated completed more than 22 rounds of data collection. They answered countless questions. They gave blood, so literally body and soul, and urine samples, and were repeatedly measured and scanned. So we're honored to have a few of, um, of, these, of the three generations of these participants in the audience and on the program today. And I actually want to ask the participants to stand up. really wonderful to have you here. Um, I hope you have good memories. <laughs> and tomorrow the book launches in Soweto. Participants uh, will reconnect with each other and with the study, but equally important for the study to thank the participants for their long commitment through a celebration honoring their involvement. So today we will hear from the founders of the study, Professor Noel Cameron, who I think is going to be online, uh, and Professor Linda Richter, Professor Shane Norris, uh, whose efforts have been its backbone and in, the, in the last decade and more, and an early patron of the study. Thank you, Shane. And then we're going to hear from a very exciting person, mountaineer extraordinaire, uh, Sibasisu Vilani, and of course, the, the various participant perspectives. So in many ways, as they turn 32, the birth to 30 years are at a pivotal moment in their lives. And this book marks the same for the study, and we all look forward to its continuing success. So with that, I would like to hand back over, and also to say I, um, 
I, I'm here representing the, our vice chancellor who really wanted to be here and I think might pop in. So hopefully he does and um, uh, we'll get to, to see him too. So, so thank you very much. Okay, so to keep it moving, next will be Professor Noel Cameron, who's gonna be joining us virtually. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? You have, you have disabled my video camera. You need to enable it to see me. Okay, you see me now? Can you see me now? Can you hear me now? The sound is very bad. Would you like me to start? Would you like me to start? You can start, sir. I can start. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. Okay. Firstly, uh, can I send my congratulations to Linda uh, on producing this book on Birth to 30. It, uh, it really is a remarkable achievement. And when I read it and went through it, I felt really very grateful and humbled indeed to have been part of the study since its literal conception uh, in 1987. As Linda has written, the origins of the, of the study are to be found in a series of fortuitous coincidences that came together at the end of 1986 and the beginning of 1987. Derek Yach's leadership of the Center for Epidemiological Research in South Africa and my, I should say, typically demanding letter to the head of the MRC being just two of those coincidences. I had gone to South Africa in 1984 with the ambition of undertaking studies of the growth and by implication the health of black children. I was fortunate in my first two years in the country to have been able to initiate two longitudinal studies in Ubombo KwaZulu and Falvata on the farm of a pediatrician, Dr. Peter Farrant in Lipopo province. These studies were technically possible because I used my students at Vic's medical school who were taking an honors class in human biology to measure and assess the children. However, I really wanted to set up a longitudinal birth cohort study and being relatively new to the country, <coughs> excuse me, I was not well known enough to uh, either access child health services or to obtain significant research funding. I therefore lacked the infrastructure required to organize and run such a venture. So I decided that nothing would or perhaps could be lost by asking the Medical Research Council president directly for special consideration for funding. In the Birth to 30 book, Linda accurately describes my meeting with two formidable characters, Professor Andres Brink, president of the Medical Research Council and Professor Philip Valentine Tobias, head of the Department of Anat Anatomy and my immediate boss. Expecting the worst, I attended the meeting with some misgivings, but rather than scold me for making such an impertinent request of the president of the Medical Research Council, Andreas Brink offered me the opportunity to initiate exactly what I wanted, a longitudinal study based in Soweto and Johannesburg with Medical Research Council support. Whilst birth to 10, as it was then called, coincided with South Africa's journey out of apartheid, it wasn't a coincidence that it did. As Linda has described it so well, those of us who first started working on the study in the late 1980s did so because we were convinced that apartheid was ending and that there would be a need for the information on child health and growth of urban children in a post-apartheid South Africa. Indeed, the last sentence in the papers I published in scientific journals and spoke in international presentations during that time were, and I quote, this research is dedicated to a post-apartheid, non-racial, democratic South Africa. 
I well remember that at the end of a presentation I was making in Hungary in September of 1994, a questioner from the floor asked me whether I would still be using that dedication at the end of my scientific papers now that Nelson Mandela was president following democratic elections. My response was that whilst apartheid had to all intents and purposes ended, the achievement of a non-racial democratic South Africa had only just begun. And studies such as Birth to 10 were fundamentally important in striving for those aims, but it would take a generation or two before they could be achieved successfully. It is often said that organizing academics is like herding cats and creating the multidisciplinary team that, that would eventually need to be brought together to, to initiate and run Birth to 10 was no mean feat. <clears throat> Indeed, in my recollection, the response to my invitation to collaborate in the Birth to 10 study was often negative with concerns about the ability to turn a cross-sectional study of birth size into a longitudinal study of growth and health. However, our persistence, enthusiasm, powers of persuasion and sheer bloody mindedness eventually paid off. So that within three years of the first meeting between Derek and me, we, collect, we collected data on the first birth to 10 baby. It wasn't enough, however, to simply start collecting data on growth and health on, on babies. We had to manage the data and make it available for analysis. Computer-based methods of big data storage, data cleaning and editing were still in their infancy. <clears throat> and the quantity of information being collected was increasing at an exponential rate as the first babies were being remeasured before later babies had arrived. Indeed, I think that the data management methods that were adopted, adapted, developed and used with the birth to 30 database were eventually fundamental to the success of the study. But what an area of unknown complexity they were when we first started out on birth to 10. I have recollections of selling the idea and the need for funding of birth to 10 to Michael O'Dowd, who you may remember was chairman of the Chairman's Fund at Anglo-American. <coughs> Derek had the habit, sorry, Michael had the habit, of leaning back in his chair and closing his eyes whilst he listened to one's pitch for funding. Believing that he had perhaps fallen asleep, I turned to his assistant to mime my inquiry as to whether I should continue. He silently signaled that I should continue with my supplication regardless of the apparently comatose chairman. And thank goodness Odell had, of course, heard every word and I was ultimately successful. I was fortunate to meet the national director of Kentucky Fried Chicken at a Sunday lunch party and left with the promise of a people carrier, which was to be carjacked at gunpoint inside the Chris Harney Baragwanath Hospital only a few weeks after delivery. I twisted the arm of a friend at a leading advertising company <coughs> to use the services of their graphic designers without payment to create our first logo. And I have a very fond memory of Derek and I journeying with Lucy Wagstaff <coughs> excuse me again, journeying with Lucy Wagstaff into what she described as deep Soweto to get the approval of the local community health authority to the collection of postnatal health data at local health clinics and the sealing of that approval with a glass of schnapps at nine in the morning. I have recollections too of feeling that we were making a real contribution to child health services in Soweto and Johannesburg through the encouragement of accurate measurement of babies and children with apparently with appropriately cal calibrated instruments to weigh them and measure their length. Indeed, perhaps one of the most important legacies of the, of the success of a study like Birth to 30 is to create a tradition of undertaking well-designed research on children to understand what constrains their growth and health and what can be done to relieve those constraints most successfully. Finally, let me say that my science of human biology was famously described by the 1960 Nobel Prize winner, Sir Peter Medawar, the father of implantation, as, and I quote, not so much a discipline as a certain attitude of mind towards the most interesting and important of animals. As I think back to the early days of this birth cohort study, it is the attitude of mind of my colleagues and collaborators that I, that I remember most. Their ultimate enthusiasm for and dedication to the creation of this study 
was what finally made it the largest and most detailed study of child health in Africa. And that really is a magnificent achievement. So congratulations to you all and congratulations to Linda on the launch of her book. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so now we're gonna hand over to Professor Linda Rakhta who's going to give us the real meat of today. And she needs no introduction, but because something has to be said, you know, for um, we, we, we really think of Professor Rector in many ways in the COE um, as the person who has probably mentored all of us into some kind of understanding of what we want to do with our lives. That is the best introduction that we can give to it. I think it's apt for this particular occasion for this book because she has directed and given life to this particular project in the most amazing way. So thank you, Professor Rector. Please come through. <clears throat> that is truly a lovely tribute and something I will hold dear that you consider me to have done that. So welcome everyone. Um, no, I was going to say 34 years ago, but Noel reminded me that it was considerably before that, because actually the whole thing started way back in 1986. I'm a bit shorter here. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Is that coming through okay? Okay, thanks. So as Noel said, he and Derek Yach, who was then at the Medical Research Council, fundamentally started Birth to 10 with this grant from Dr. Andres Brink. Now, Brink himself, and as I described this in the book, of course, much of it is in lots more detail in the book, he took his mandate from the cabinet. And the cabinet at that time was very aware that a demographic reckoning was imminent as a result of the collapse and dismantling of apartheid legislation in the late 1980s, that had forcibly moved and kept pe black people out of largely urban white areas, there was going to be rapid migration into towns and cities that were ill-prepared to pr provide for increasing numbers of residents looking for better living conditions. Now, Derek brought me into the study as the child development person, together with Professor Lucy Wagstaff, who was also one of the originators, Alan Rothberg and Peter Cooper, who's here today, um, the two pediatricians. Sharon Fon was employed as the first coordinator and she led the pilot studies that paved the way to mount the, the birth cohort enrollment in April, 1990. I have to say, from then on, absolutely nothing went according to plan. <laughs> None of us had the experience, staff, time, nor financial resources to roll out a study of some 3,200 children born into the poorly planned, planned geography of Soweto and the residential complexity of Johannesburg with its freestanding houses, blocks of flats, so-called servants' quarters, and colored and Indian areas. We muddled through with short-term secondments, grants from Kentucky and others, short-term secondments of personnel, facilities, and funding from participating researchers and institutions. But with the dedication and ingenuity of Professor Tia DeVette as the coordinator, who's now at the University of Johannesburg, as well as others, we mounted the study and collected five years of good quality data. Unfortunately, both Derek and Noel left South Africa in the mid-1990s and birth to 10 began to flounder. The number of children and families we were able to reach through annual data collection dropped just over a thousand. And by 1996, we published only 10 papers on the study. At this time, Professor Shane Norris joined the study as a postgraduate student and research assistant to Professor John Pettiford. Towards the end of the 1990s, John secured a five-year Wellcome Trust grant and I secured the first of five Wellcome Trust grants to study child and adolescent development through the cohort. That gave us the money. A transition to birth to 20 was conceived and Shane gradually took the reins as project manager and later co-principal investigator. A successful longitudinal study was now in sight. The cohort is now 32 years old. We've published more than 270 papers, successfully supervised 62 postgraduate students, co-opted and renovated a building on the grounds of Chris, Chris Harney Baragwanath Hospital, employed several staff members for more than 25 years, outfitted an internationally accredited laboratory, installed cutting edge tech and equipment, 
and to date, to date collected more than 20 million raw data points on close to 2,000 individuals over 22 data collection waves between birth and adulthood. Birth to 30, as you heard, is the largest. And... Wait, I'm, I'm going to ask you to clap for something else. Birth to 30 is the largest and longest running birth cult in Africa, as you heard. It is known throughout the world as a highly valued source of longitudinal social and biological data. It's part of a unique co uh, collaboration between five birth cohort studies in developing countries, and its platform it has been used to launch several other large-scale multi-year projects. And at this point, I want you, Shane, to take a bow and for everyone to clap for Shane, because that is his single-handed achievement. It took me more than three years to write the book we're launching today. Even though there was more time during COVID, I don't I know about other people, but social isolation drained my motivation. I finally finished in 20, July, 2021. And at that point, I found that I'd structured the book into four sections. The first four chapters is a section I call the stories about how the study started and why. Then I have three chapters on the people, the children, their families, and the circumstances they were living in then and now. And then there are five chapters on science and two concluding chapters. I realized while writing that there were many stories. I was thinking of there was a story about the study. There were many stories crisscrossing each other throughout the whole book. There was the story of the political transformation, the story of language, of technological and methodological change, stories of the scientific work and collaborations, and from what is now my retrospective view, the stories of people and their relationships. So starting with the political story, by 1986, the scrapping of the past laws and the influx control, it was clear that the apartheid state was crumbling. On the 11th of February, 1990, just week, six weeks before the birth, first birth to 20 child was born, Nelson Mandela was released from Victor Fustair prison. Apartheid structures and their dismantling affected every part of people's lives. Health services were fragmented. There were 97 public health clinics in the study area of Soweto and Johannesburg, operating under five municipalities divided by race. The safety of children and families and our staff were under threat. Sorry, I must have a sip. Um, We're under threat from security forces, rival political factions, and boycotting forces. Ordinary people themselves didn't always know how the changing political and re legal regime governed their lives. For example, nearly a quarter of women who gave birth in this study, time, and area uh, parameters gave false addresses. Um, they weren't resident in the area. They'd come from outlying areas and rural areas under the mistaken belief that their children would have the right to live as adults in this major urban center. And this would convert to a major advantage of them, on them. But of course, influx control had been um, abolished in 1986. So people were living as if the history was a shadow in their lives. The, the political context present and past affected the study greatly, particularly with respect to who enrolled and who stayed in the study. More white and more affluent Indian families used private gynecologists, and it was not going to be possible with our personnel and financial resources to reach individual women through private gynecologists, even if they had consented to cooperate with us. For this reason, the decision was made right from the start that we would recruit the cohort through public service, antenatal delivery, and postnatal clinics. And as such, we enrolled 87% of all colored children who were born in the area, 76% of all black children who were born in the area, 70% of Indian women, and 38% of white children. The small proportion of white children during, born during the six-week enrollment period in 1990, 678 of them in total, dwindled over time as white people dropped from 12% to 8% of the national population, moved to other cities and countries, and their isolation between, behind high walls blocked our attempts to make contact. By the time we reached the 28-year data collection point, birth to 30 had become largely a study of people who were not white. That meant we had a constrained range of socioeconomic variation without the top end of wealth, and thus many of our results underestimate the impact of poverty and hardship. 
that they belonged to particular population groups was neither here nor there. It was really that we were cutting off the top end of the society. Turning to the language story, issues with language unfolded in two ways, during enrollment and during data collection. Names and addresses were often incorrectly transcribed into birth notifications in, in delivery centers, and again, incorrectly transcribed when they got to the municipal registers. Lack of coordination between municipalities resulted in some births being recorded two or three in three registers under two or three name variations. At the time, too, there were at least two orthographies or spelling conventions for African names and words in general. In addition, conventions for spelling a name, a similar sounding name, varies across different languages. So, for example, Hadebi in Isizulu is often spelled Radebi in Isikosa. Apparently given to him on his first day of school by his teacher, Miss Stephen Garner. From all this, we had to compile a cohort database and then try to find people where much of Soweto had inconsistent house numbering systems and few street names. Johannesburg and Soweto were and probably still are the most linguistically diverse areas in the country. All 11 official languages are spoken and some others. We intended to interview mothers and families in their home languages and so provided for formal translations and back translations in Sulu, Sutu, English, and Afrikaans. But we had to supplement standard methods using what is now called collaborative and iterative translation to achieve meaningful equivalence of the questionnaires because the rich local language variants, which were evolving all the time, idiomatic expressions, and mixed languages and code switching used in Soweto often defied translation by academics and interpreters. And then there's the technology and methodolo methodology story that Noel referred to. In 1989, when the data started coming in, the MRC used a mainframe computer with disks the size of large cake bins. My husband, and in Portland, my husband, Deb Pressel, was a technophile and had the first Apple desktop computers in the country in his research unit. Management of the database evolved from mainframe through DBase on Apple floppies to Excel on Stiffies, Access on Windows based desktop computers, SQL on la laptops, and for the first time in 2018, from any computer anywhere using any statistical software through Red Cap. Similar transitions occurred in data collection techniques from paper and pencil interviewer administered questionnaires that had to be double punched into data files to mobile phones to audio computer assisted self interviewing to desktop and tablet entry by participants with intelligent code and, and data programs. Questionnaires and assessment instruments underwent revisions and took different forms at different ages. So cognitive capacities measured differently at one year, 10 years, and 21 years. All of this prompted me to formulate what is Lin known as Linda's adage, which everybody in birth disability knows. That is if you measure a construct once, and as in a cross-sectional study, you have a very self-satisfied fact. Measure it twice and have you, you have to deal with inconsistency of measurement. Measure it three or more times and it gets really interesting and very complicated. There are, of course, many science stories. The published papers from the study cover a wide array of topics. From an example of Simpson's paradox, which is the reversal of the direction of an association when an additional explanatory variable is taken into account, in a high-flying statistical journal to a paper on adolescence published in science. In the book, I cover some of the major scientific findings of the study under five headings, violence, learning and education, growth and health, mental and social well-being, and social engagement. I'll start with violence because violence and cruelty are endemic in South Africa, associated with, amongst others, the structural violence of apartheid, political violence, collective violence resistance, the ongoing violence struggles for power and resources, criminal violence, xenophobic violence, and interpersonal violence. We looked at instances of witnessed, experienced, and perpetrated violence through 350 plus items uh, over time from pregnancy to 28 years of age, amongst males and females, and across home, community, school, and workplaces. 
violence begins early in the lives of children through, for example, part of party beatings during pregnancy and harsh physical punishment of young children at home. We found that by the age of 18, only 1% of children in our sample had not witnessed or experienced some form of violence. And that close to 50% had experienced or witnessed violence at home, school, and in their communities. We reported on sexual violence experienced across age, highlighting the vulnerability of young boys as well as girls, and the role of same age perpetrators as well as older men. Sadly, at age 28, we found that about a third of men and women reported that they were both physically abused and abused their partner in their intimate relationship. But amongst the most salient scientific findings across the best of topics covered in the study are those that support what is called the developmental theory of origins of health and disease. Physical growth, cognitive capacity, and mental health can all be tracked from parents through to early childhood and into the adult years. In general, young people are born with the physical and social potential bestowed on them by their parents and the circumstances in which their parents live. In turn, their parents were born with the potential that their own parents and their circumstances bestowed on them. And the birth to 30 cohort are passing these intergenerational influences onto their own children. In each generation, as Lynn said, this potential can be boosted or dampened by changes in socioeconomic circumstances, better access to quality services and opportunities that families provide for their children. Examples of how the well-being of the BT30 generation has been boosted during the last 30 years are that birth to 30 women are on average one centimeter taller than their mothers. More than half passed matric whereas only a quarter of their mothers did. And more birth to 30 women live in households with consumer goods, such as a car, a refrigerator, and a washing machine. On the downside, more birth to 30 women had their first pregnancy before 18 years than their mothers. More birth to 30 women in their, than their mothers smoke and drink alcohol, feel overwhelmed by debt and report intimate by, uh, partner violence and depression. These experiences and exposures in early childhood and intergenerationally create footpaths to adult health and human capital. However, as Lynn said, these effects are not fixed. There's substantial room for individual trajectories to be changed. While South Africa has changed, it has not changed enough or changed in the right direction for all young people to reach their full potential, free of the constraints of generations and poverty and adversity. Well-functioning families take up the slack and many young people in birth to city have achieved beyond their own and their parents' dearest hopes. I'm so, unfortunately, some have not. Just days before I was due to interview a young man for this book, his mother contacted the study to report that her son had just been sentenced to 40 years of imprisonment for murder and hijacking. I have long felt a responsibility to tell the story of birth to 30, mainly because I'm the only person among the group that started the study in 1989 who's still actively involved in the project. And also because for me, many of the staff and the participants in their family, <coughs> birth to 30 was always more than a study. I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to contribute to and be part of birth to 30. I think of it as one of the big achievements of my career. During the course of the last 33 years, enduring friendships have been formed, love affairs and marriages entered into, divorces and separations happen, children born and loved ones died. We are all connected with one another in many ways. Shane and his wife Stella, for example, had a traditional wedding in the birth to city office where Stella was instructed in the ways of a Makoti. Sabila Sabia, who can't be with us today because of family bereavement, celebrated last year her 30th anniversary as a staff member of Birth to 30. She developed from being a data collector in the field to being a skilled radiographer, radiographer in all the measurements of bone and in the feet part measurement of uh, infant body composition. Apart from creating a historic record of the study, my main motivation in writing this book is to affirm the experiences of the participants, to contribute to their memories and ensure that they, their families and their children know what a significant study birth city is. 
and what an important contribution their participation has made to science and policy. At the book launch tomorrow in Soweto, all participants will receive a free copy of the book, thanks to a grant from the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust. And I know there are people from the OMT here, and I just want to say thank you very, very much. In closing, I'm delighted to introduce some of the Birth to City participants. I think that Guatemala Molete is here. Did you? There. Oh, so please come forward. We're, we're very glad to have Guatemala here, not only because she is a second generation Birth to City participant, meaning she was born in 1990, but because she's a Vitsi. She's a graduate of the, of the university, and she has established herself in labor law and policy development. So, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm getting a bit nervous, and now I wasn't. <laughs> I think Prof. Linda has kind of outlined the journey throughout, and it was very overwhelming to hear how it's been. I mean, Having been, I, I, I remember in primary school when my mom had to drag me to these birth to 10 um, data collection um, things. Well, I didn't understand what it was, but I knew I was a special child. And I kind of assumed every child born in 1990 was part of it. <laughs> However, I, I was kind of, I was different in that when I got to birth to 10, and I know I, I was born in 1990, like <clears throat> Prof. Linda has just indicated in June. But when I got there, I, I felt I felt important. I felt like I was doing something other children were not doing. So having having grown up uh, being dragged to these birth to ten things, what I enjoyed about birth to ten was that I got there and I got a lot of munchies. It was so nice for me. <laughs> it was absolutely nice to get there and have these adults fuss over me about everything that I did. Wanted to know what I ate last night. Wanted to know what we were doing at home. How school was. And for me, getting to these um, kind of uh, getting these invitations were always about me being put on a pedestal. Um, um, having then gone through school, gone through my puberty and changes, birth to 20 then came around and I thought, why are these people, why are they really interested in what we're doing? Um, but I think the importance of the data collection and the importance of what was being done was raised to me when I got into high school. I uh, started going through puberty, I started questioning myself, what was from, what I was doing, but also I, I kind of knew that it, it's created it sparked something in me I got into high school was very interested in history did very well in history and English and and having be, my articulation of things my ability to speak was raised from that because in 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 these sessions you were encouraged to speak what happened last night what, what happened to you at school are you dating now I remember the first one of the first people that knew that I was dating and actually sexually active were the people that were collecting the data it was quite honestly it was it was quite weird but we we had the relationship where it was open enough for me to be able to speak like that there were instances where I got into trouble and the first people that were that called my mom to speak well it's a bit too personal for me to speak about but the first people that actually were able to call my mom and say look Vitimelo is going through a certain thing and you need to come in I at that point received the most heartwarming and um, deepest psychological support. I needed it at the time. It was quite a taboo thing to speak about psychology, speak about your feelings. But I remembered that I could go there. I remembered that I could get into those offices and I had mothers and fathers and brothers that were would be able to carry me through it. Um, I unfortunately went through a whole lot of deeper psychological issues. I, I then attempted suicide. And these were the people that were carrying me through. Even when I was admitted at Barra, birth to 20 employees, data collectors came to the ward. They were very specific on, you need to be okay. We're here for you. Do you need anything? And throughout, I always knew that I had that support. So it's quite ironic that what happened is just data collection at, uh, from birth to 10 was something that I thought was useless, but I then got, it sparked an interest in research for me. It sparked an interest in wanting to know more. I became very inquisitive. I, I became very, yeah, I was that child that wanted to know what was happening. I then fortunately got into varsity, matriculated, 
got into Varsity, I, I'm the first graduate from uh, my mother's side and my father's side of the family, first generation of graduates. I was afforded so many opportunities because at a young age, I was exposed to how it is important for you to speak, how it is important for you to know what you're doing, to articulate yourself well. So birth to 20, birth to 30 now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in reading the data. Puff Linda spoke about a lot of things that I was like, ah, oh, she's probably speaking about me there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be very interesting to, to read and to actually see the product, the end product of what at a younger age I thought was nothing but speaking to me about nothing. Um, so thank you, Prof. Linda, for being Thanks. persistent, for assisting us also to grow, because this is this is quite amazing. And I'd like to thank everyone that was involved in ensuring that this product comes through, the data collectors, the staff at birth to 20, birth to 30. Everyone made an impact and we are who we are now because of, of your inputs. Thanks. Thank you very much. The other participant I want to call up is Mbali Oratilo Magashua. Mbali is here. She's a third generation participant. Can I have Mbali? Mbali, coming. Um, she's a third generation participant. I think I can reveal her age. She's 16. So her family has been in the study intergenerationally. Her mother, her father was one of the children born in 1990. Her grandmother, Z, is here. Z, won't you stand up? Um, so Z was one of the pregnant women who were enrolled in the study. And then because of that, what's something that just illustrates this idea that this was never just a study, Z has worked at Birth to 30 in various capacities for 20 years. So, Mbali, do you want to say a few words? <laughs> oh, um, hi, I'm Mali. I'm the third, I'm part of the third generation. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and meet you all. I'm really excited to read the book. Thanks a lot. So we have these three generations. Generation one were people like Z, who were the mothers. Generation two are the participants. Generation three are their children. And there is generation four. And if we were able to raise the money, we would be able to track and study generation four. So what to say at the end? I don't want to draw conclusions about the lives that are only just half lived. So much can change for these young people. As Helen Pearson said of the five great British cohort studies, we know where they start, but we don't know where they're going to end up. Birth to 20 participants were two years old when the Constitution was promulgated as the supreme law of the Republic of South Africa. All they know is a free South Africa, though neither the country, their parents, themselves, nor all of us are yet as free in the many ways that many of us had envisioned. But I would now like to turn to introducing Sibusi Suvalani, without doubt South Africa's greatest expeditioner. In 2003, he summited the south side of Everest, the first black man to do it. And only a heroic and very special person would put himself through a, such a life-threatening situation to, to undertake the experience again. He did it in 2005 from the more difficult north side of Everest. And he did it for the benefit of Birth to City and the SOS Children's Villages. Since then, Sibusiso has completed all of what are called the Seven Summits and trekked to the North and South Poles. With these, he has achieved what is called the Explorer's Grand Challenge, one of only a handful of people in the world. Sibusiso dedicated his 1,113 kilometer journey to the South Pole in 2008 to the children of South Africa. When, if only more of them knew about such an extraordinary man. When I interviewed Sibu Sisa for the book, we talked about the sense of freedom that the birth to 30 participants feel. He said he understood deeply and that it resonated in his heart too. He spoke of encouraging young people to value their political and psychological freedom and that their next step was to learn how to use it. So over to you, Sibu Sisa.
I speak so we you your mic is not registering that you're speaking. Let's try, let's try. Let's try. And how, let's try. How, how, how are we doing now? How are we doing now? Um, okay. Where right, do I go for? Hello? We can hear you, sir. Please continue. You can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Please continue. All right. Thank you very much. Apologies on that. Um, it's always good to have people who are able to have those magic fingers. Um, I would like to appreciate the opportunity to everyone and thank you for that kind introduction, uh, uh, Professor Linda. I I'm going to just share very briefly and uh, to say how did I get involved with the project because I'm not in any way near scientists. I'm an adventurer who likes to go to some tallest mountains and sometimes very cold places. But I'd just come back from Mount Everest in 2003 on my first ascent, which had been successful. And it was one of those which when I left the mountain, I knew very well that I was never gonna go back to another mountain or a mountain as big as Mount Everest. But after sitting at home and thinking about it very deeply to ask, answering the question, what would really make you to go back? I realized that it is one of those things that you don't just do. It's one of those things that you need something within that will make you want to decide to go back. But while I was still pondering on that, a friend of mine who I challenged to go back to climb Everest um, telephoned me and said, will you be willing to climb Everest with me um, in 2003? There was, we were talking in 2004. So I quickly went around trying to find the reason for me to go back. And I realized that the only way I could go back to climb Everest was to do it for charity. Because I thought that would be the one thing that would really want me to go back and be able to challenge such um, an undertaking with the agony that comes with it, with the cold that comes with it, I realized that it cannot be just a personal journey. So I was working some ideas as to who to support. I realized that my only interest had always been the upbringing of children, their education. And I thought if one day I would get a chance to contribute to a program or to children themselves, um, I would be delighted to do it. So I thought this was a perfect chance for me then to go to Mount Everest and do it for charity where there's awareness about the charities. And as such, I chose the three, as uh, Professor Linda mentioned, birth to 20 then, when I met them in 2004, they were birth to 20. And then the SOS Student Village and the Africa Foundation. So these three were very important for me because they were all education focused, particularly paying attention on children and their upbringing. I don't think I would have found any enough or good reason to go to the mountain without those. And I think I would like to say to us all, all we need really is to find enough reason why you want to do what you want to do, because once you've got that enough reason, then you've got enough reason to keep on going when temperatures are minus 20, minus 30, or as freezing as they are in Johannesburg uh, this morning and in Oswald this morning. So with that enough reason I went and obviously the rest is history because I climbed Everest. But my whole hope is was to raise funds because when you climb the mountain, you don't uh, arrive at the top and you get a, a 1 million uh, rand or dollar check uh, with you. You need some PR around it. You need some people to donate. So we had already been trying to encourage people to be part of this journey. But it was at some point very difficult to sort of articulate clearly what, what does Beth to 20 do and what is this research all about? And I didn't really mind. 
So that is to say, it is so delighting and very exciting for me to be able to, at the end, after many, many years, say there is a book that has come out. And thank you to the effort of Professor Linda and those that probably supported her throughout the journey. I mean, three years is a very long time to work and put a book together. But if you have got enough reason why it has to happen, then you don't stop. You keep fighting on until it is materialized, as we say today. So uh, I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Um, I, I would have been uh, excited to be there, but my, my, I've just come back from another mountain. But in a way or the other, what I'm trying to say is it was very generous and very kind of people to be able to donate money that I ended up sharing between the three charities and Birth to 20 being one of the beneficiaries, which I was so fulfilled with that because there's no way I could have been able to sign up a check to give to them because I believed in the project, I believed in the research, I believed in the data, I thought it was very critically important uh, for the country to be able to know what is happening around its children. But much more so today, it is important to the participants themselves to be able to realize that freedom came to them and the people that who were yesteryears were before them would really didn't have the freedom that they so enjoy today. So it is just a question of, are they recognizing that opportunity of being free, of being free to do anything you want and in whatever field you want? Like myself, I'm free to go anywhere I want in the world doing adventure. I think that is the appreciation we should all acknowledge and, um, and accept and take full responsibility for it to say, we, we are free, we have a choice. Um, and it is only up to us to be able to just um, manage and make sure that we, we enjoy the freedom to the fullest. So I, I feel that in a way, it was such a small gesture for me to put myself into that situation to physically go and get tormented on Everest where Every step when I was slogging along, when it was minus 30, when we're sitting in a storm, when we couldn't go for the summit attempt, I still thought, well, if there's a child that will get their quality education, if there will be a child that will be researched upon, I will just keep on fighting on because I had enough reason to do that. So yeah, I want to end up by congratulating the, uh, Professor Linda and all her supporters and everyone that supported the project and the participants themselves. But again, it's, a, it's a one of those that one wanted to, at the end, live with those words from Nelson Mandela that we are here today, but then we can then or linger. So if the journey continues. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful afternoon. And I'm so looking forward to tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, CBC. So um, one of the fond memories while he was doing that summit, uh, Michelle Friedman was the project coordinator of Birth to 20 at that stage. And so CBC, so not only were you, you know, climbing for your charities, but in a way you were motivating more people on the ground. So what we did is we built, uh, we, we took the, Emer uh, the Everest silhouette and as he was journeying, we would plot it and kind of mark it. But at the same time, on the other side, we would mark how many participants we had seen. And so we had used his journey as a way of trying to get as many participants seen in that data collection way. So it's amazing how everyone kind of dovetails and interconnects in the study. So firstly, just um, a few final words um, as we bring this event to a close. For me, it's been an incredible journey. I've been so fortunate as a post-grad, can you imagine, to be landed up into, <laughs> into this incredible study. And, um, you know, Noel and John to have worked with them right at the beginning, and then Linda and many other investigators along the way. And obviously I met my wife there. <laughs> so <laughs> the study has, means a lot in many, many ways. And so when you read the book, the book is amazing. I am a little biased, but I think you're gonna really enjoy it. It's a bit of a thriller. You can sense <laughs> the anxiety sometimes that the study produced. It's hilarious in moments, and it's absolutely a tearjerker. So many times while reading it, I was uh, boil, boiling my eyes out. It's, 
it's just because it's real. And Linda, that's what you've done such an amazing job. You brought the reality of this type of project and what it means to get off the ground, to maintain it, to deliver on the science, um, and to not only from the staff or the participant point of view, but all the many students that have benefited from being part, and some of them are even here in the audience. So, um, and it was remarkable, the story that you came back from one of your trips in London, that actually one of the previous directors of the population and public health in Wellcome Trust did a master's on birth to 20 data. So, you know, in many ways, this study far reaches at what we even know how it reaches in, and so it was phenomenal. And it's been such a privilege to be part yeah. of um, the study and the people and the participants. So with that, many, many, many thanks to our funders. It's been a struggle, but it, without that, this would never have happened. VITS and the MRC were right there from the beginning. So big thanks to the university and the South African Medical Research Council. Wellcome Trust was pivotal at a critical turning point from 10 to 20. Um, and there've been some other key funders, the Human Sciences Research Council, um, Anglo-American Chairman's Fund, um, DSI NRF, um, the Gates Foundation in the recent um, data collection, and the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust for providing funds to Linda for this amazing project of putting the book together. Um, it's been a real team effort and um, big thanks to the team behind the scenes that put this event together and tomorrow's event in Soweto. So big thanks to Sarah and to Letu and Boyo and the Center of Excellence of Human Development team. It's been an absolute privilege to work with you and it's many, many late nights putting everything together. So big thanks. And then just two final things to say. One, your book is there. So please pick up your copy um, and, um, and enjoy it. So it's, I think it's a phenomenal book and mm. there is plenty of food. So please join us. <laughs> Food is a big part of everything we've done in Birds of Pity. And so it's just around the corner. There's some refreshments. Please join us. And, and thank you so much for attending. Thanks.